Good, so, uh, so I just joined EGG, as he said. Uh, I've been at Wayfair for a while before that. Um, uh, and my job really at, at uh, DGG is gonna be supporting clients and kind of helping people understand how to use the tools. And then also diving into Rabbit PBR. So a lot of things that I did at Wayfair when I was there for six years was developing the pipeline of how artists create 3D models and how they transform those into real-time models and also just for rendering high-res realistic stuff. Um, so uh, the other thing is like developing the community and kind of supporting uh, developers understanding the product and kind of developing that whole kind of ecosystem. So I come from like a game development background. I spent about 20 years working in games, making both rendered stuff and real-time stuff. Uh, and my whole thing is all about uh, solving problems, right? I just love solving tactical problems. The puzzles are the things that are most interesting. Uh, and with Kronos Group, uh, they develop GLTF as a 3D standard and a whole bunch of other real-time standards. Uh, and so I've been in those uh, like weekly conference calls with a lot of leaders across the industry talking about technology and about kind of how we can improve that whole ecosystem. Um, and one of my chief um, kind of help in that system is uh, helping to improve the material system for GLTF, which is that 3D format, and how can we make materials better? So I contribute 3D models that basically test the system and, and figure out where it's really poor and where it needs to improve and working with technologists to kind of improve that whole system. So, so my talk today is really about uh, uh, GLTF textures and I realized that, you know, I just didn't know enough about all the different texture formats that are out there uh, and what's possible in GLTF. So I kind of did a deep, deep dive to kind of figure out uh, what should I use and when. And one of the things that came out fairly recently is KTX uh, two format, which is really a GPU compressed texture format. Um, and I loved learning about that because it's a really cool um, feature now that makes it much easier to, to load content on the GPU. So I wanted to make a slide first off that's like an answer first. Like if you watch nothing else in this whole talk, this is the answers to everything, right? <laughs> so like you can leave after this slide, that's it. Uh, but basically I wanted to say there's four basic texture formats that you can use in a GLTF real-time model and uh, which one you choose based on uh, what you're gonna do with the model. So if you're just delivering a single asset to like a, a product display page or an AR experience, then really just use WebP for everything. It's super small, it's super efficient. Uh, the only thing is it doesn't work that great on a normal map. So uh, it just gets too noisy and messy and you lose a lot of detail. So then you use either a JPEG or a PNG based on what's in the map. Uh, and then if you're doing a multi-asset display, so like geospatial, for example, where you're streaming in a lot of 3D data, like uh, 3D you know, buildings and geometries and stuff and landscapes, then you really wanna use KTX2 because that's compressed on the GPU and it's very efficient for like loading and, and streaming data. And then if you're just using GLTF as a translation format, so a lot of people use GLTF as a way to move between 3D applications while they're authoring the content just because it's a really well understood format with really clear limitations and it's really well documented, it's really easy to like develop an importer and exporter and kind of move stuff between, so between Maya and Max and Blender and you know, other different tools. So then you just use PNG for everything because it's lossless, it makes big files, that's fine. You just wanna get the best quality because you wanna end up with a good piece of content that then you can compress later if you, compress it in advance, then you're gonna get noisy data and that compression is gonna get worse. Just like compressing a JPEG again and again is just gonna make a mess, right? So, so that's the basic use. And then the three things that you kind of think about in terms of which textures to use when, uh, the, the, I look at it as three different ways and I think about it as asset size, like how can I download it quickly to the user? Um, but then once the user gets it and they, they load it into a 3D application to actually render it in real time or even render it in um, a pre-render system, you have to upload it to the GPU. And basically that upload process of actually loading it from the disk or from the person's phone into the real-time application has to go across the system bus, has to be uncompressed usually, unless it's KTX2, um, and that takes time to uncompress it because it goes from like you know four megabytes to like 50 megabytes, it becomes a big file. 
Um, and then the last thing is, how much room do I have in memory? Because that GPU memory is fairly expensive, so they make it fairly small, right? So it's not that much room to store all your 3D data. So if you're rendering multiple models, then you really need to think about how much memory do I have, or if I'm uh, rendering a big model that's got a lot of data. So those are kind of the three things that I try to think about when I'm thinking about what texture format to use. Uh, here's the big slide that has a ton of data. But basically, this is also like the, the summary of all the information that I found, which is, and we'll go through the various things, but uh, the most important part is down at the bottom. Basically, the PNG works great for single models. It's the highest quality. It's best compatibility because it's core GLTF, so it works everywhere that GLTF works. Same thing for JPEG. It's slightly smaller, usually. Um, uh, works for single models again and best compatibility, right? Uh, WebP is fairly newer, right? It also works great for single models, um, and it's super tiny download, so much smaller than JPEG, actually, which is great. Um, but if you're really doing a configurator, a geospatial, anything with multiple models, and you're streaming stuff up and down, then really you wanna use KTX2, because it stays compressed when it goes to the GP, excuse me, the JPU. And then the last thing is UA, UASTC is the best codec within KTX2. So KTX2 is like a container format, and there are various codecs or formats you can stick inside of it. So there are two basic uh, compression algorithms for KTX2, and UA, UASTC is usually the best one to use, and I'll, I'll go through why that is. So let's go through the lossy part of it. Uh, and basically, uh, here's some great examples. So for like, uh, a normal map, which is basically encoding the differences in direction across a surface to make it look bumpy. Uh, I chose the worst possible case, which is a nice shiny surface with a lot of high frequency detail, which is text, right? And a PNG gives you a, lossy, uh, a loss, lossless compression, so you get a perfect result. You get no errors on there. When you go to JPEG, at a full quality, 100% quality, it looks pretty good. You only get a little bit of noise, but it's not that bad. But once you start to drop that quality and try to get a smaller JPEG, it really starts to turn into a noisy mess. So that's something to be careful of. Um, and then when you get to WebP, it just, <laughs> just destroys it. It just, uh, you know, because the compression is so high that it's really distorting the directions of all those surface normals that the normal map encodes. So it really doesn't work that well for high frequency normal map data. Uh, and then KTX2, there are the two compression codecs. There's UASTC, which is a higher quality. It makes a slightly larger file. And there's ETC1S, which makes a really small file size, right? That's like, you know, less than 10% of the other one. Um, but they both compress to the same in, uh, in memory. So they both stay much smaller in memory than all the rest. So really, you know, we can't use, usually for our normal maps, the WebP or the low quality JPEG or the ETC1S, it's just too noisy. We lose all that high frequency detail. So these are really, for normal map textures, these are kind of the formats to use. And it really, again, depends on your uh, delivery target. If you're delivering single assets, then I don't really care about memory as much, and I can explode the memory if I need to. But if I'm doing a whole bunch of assets and loading and unloading, then KTX2 is the thing. So occlusion roughness metal maps are another thing that is hard to compress. And what that is is you've got three different grayscale textures that are stored uh, within the same texture. So uh, at the top there's occlusion and roughness and metalness. And those are stored in the red, green, and blue channels, and those Compression algorithms usually look at all three channels together and try to compress that data together. And so you end up with this data kind of uh, noisiness that's communicated between the channels. And that creates problems. Um, but with occlusion, roughness, and models, usually you don't really notice those detailed problems. So at the bottom, we've got a WebP file. And what happens here is like in the roughness or the metalness map, we've got a lot of high frequency detail in this part of the model. And WebP really kind of destroys that. But in the rendering, it's kind of looking okay. So in this case, we could use a WebP and we'd save a lot on the download size for the model, even though it really compresses it like crazy. 
so for multiple models, then we need to look at KTX2. What are, what are the trade-offs and the disadvantages and advantages of the two different codecs? So compared to PNG, which is lossless at the top, then we've got UASTC, which produces almost an identical result to PNG if you use the right settings. So that's the, the key, is that there are certain settings that you can use within that codec, and it depends on uh, how long you want to take to process the file. It takes a long time to process a KTX2 file. If anybody here has done compression with that, uh, with that algorithm, uh, it can really like slow your machine down and the fans turn on, it goes crazy. Uh, but you produce a really high quality result. Whereas ETC1S is great at producing a really much smaller file size. You know, it's like a tenth of the file size. Um, but you end up with block compression errors. Um, so it really depends on your end result. Do you really see the block compression? You kind of don't that much, unless you get really up close to it. But it's when you look at the individual channels that you start to see, you know, there are these errors that happen. So it really depends on how small do you need to go when you want to download it and what the end result is. With neural maps, it kind of just destroyed that high frequency text detail. But with an ORM map, it's probably okay. So that kind of covers the first three rows. We talked about lossiness uh, and how much loss you get, uh, how large or small it makes the file size, and what happens on the GPU. So then another key con uh, concern is an alpha channel. So you need an alpha channel in your texture based on what features in GLTF you're using. using. Uh, and JPEG is the only one that just doesn't support an alpha channel. All the others do, so that's great. Uh, so when do you need an alpha channel? You, well, you need it for alpha coverage, so that's opacity. Like, I think like leaves on a tree are usually done with a card, uh, with like a polygon, and then you have high frequency detail with the texture. Um, so that's alpha coverage or alpha, you know, like cutoff or blend. Uh, if you use sheen, which is like for velvet or, uh, you know, fancy fall offs on the edges of things, uh, then you need a, a sheen roughness texture that is stored in the alpha channel of a texture based on GLTF spec. Same thing with specular. If you want to use a specular <laughs> texture that says, hey, these parts are more shiny than these are. Um, and then there are a couple extensions that also use the alpha channel. And those are probably less you know, frequently used, but, um, but useful. And the last thing that I think about is rendering support. Uh, with extensions, like for WebP and KTX2, you really need uh, the renderers to support those extensions. Otherwise, the texture just doesn't show up and you have a white model. So, um, so for those, it really depends upon what you're using. Right? What I found, which was surprising to me, was 3JS doesn't support KTX2 currently. And Filament, too, doesn't support WebP. So I was surprised at that as well. Um, but yeah, so I need to update my slide. That's good, that's good to know that 3JS actually supports it. Uh, but that's really important when you're ever choosing any extension. So there's a whole bunch of extensions for GLTF that do like Sheen and Specular and uh, a bunch of other clear coat, different effects. Um, you need to check and make sure that your renderer actually supports it. So that's, again, that's the overall takeaways, right? Are you delivering single assets? Then WebP is great, and JPEG or PNG, based on the file size, which one makes a smaller file. If you've got a normal map, for example, that has a lot of flat colors in it, then a PNG is gonna compress really well because it's a run length encoded, so it looks at single, you know, a line of pixels are all the same value, it'll store just one pixel. Uh, so that makes a really small file. And if it's a multi-asset, then KTX2 is really probably the best choice because you've got GPU limitations of loading and unloading. Uh, and then translation, of course, if you're just doing it for authoring, then PNG for everything. Uh, and then that web page, uh, I just recently updated with all my assets that I made for the Kronos Group uh, demos to kind of show off different texture features and material features. Uh, and I used WebP for all my models, except for the neural maps, because they started to fall apart. Um, so then, you know, choose on an asset basis which textures makes the most sense. But that uses actually WebP and it uses um, uh, Model Viewer for all the rendering. Um, and that's basically it. That's it for my talk.